All right, thank you very much, Anita, and thanks uh, a lot for the invitation to give a talk in the um, CMSA seminar series. So this talk is about algorithmic approaches to reconstructing evolutionary networks, which are also called phylogenetic networks. And this is based on joint work with Peter Humphreys and Charles Simple. So let me start by um, giving you a quick introduction into what phylogenetics is about. And when I mean phylogenetics, or when I talk about phylogenetics, I basically mean the reconstruction and analysis of evolutionary trees and networks. And the reconstruction is based on molecular um, sequence data usually nowadays. So for example, DNA sequences or protein sequences. And you can see three phylogenetic trees on the slide. So this is the very first phylogenetic tree that Charles Darwin drew in 1837 when he um, came up with this idea of representing evolution in a tree-like way. And then Carl Wurse draw this tree where he clearly um, showed that um, he was thinking about three kingdoms of life, uh, which are the three kingdoms, bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. And nowadays we get these huge trees, which we call like tree of lives, so where we have like thousands of leaves. And we try to come up with a tree that best explains the evolutionary history of all the present day species, if you like. So because we have all this molecular sequence data nowadays and biologists are producing more and more of this data, it is important to come up with good algorithms to compute these trees. And also more recently, people started looking into phylogenetic networks. And I will say more about why we are shifting from trees to networks minute. So let me first start um, by giving you an idea of what a phylogenetic tree is. And I'm really considering like, in fact, a graph theoretic tree. So I have the root, my trees are all rooted. So I have the root at the top of the page and then the leaves at the bottom and the leaves are what we um, have data for. So usually we consider like a set of leaves and each leaf, for example, represents a present day species. And then the internal vertices are hypothetical um, species, for example, extinct species for which we do not have any information. And you can also think of each internal vertex as a speciation. So at some point, in the past, a species has accumulated a bunch of um, mutation and it splits into two new species at each internal vertex. The underlying assumption of all these trees is that each species descends exactly from one ancestor. So again, what we do know is we do have data for the leaves, but we do not have any data for these extinct species. So given some data for the leaves, the um, goal is to come up with a tree that best explains the data at the leaves. And um, in 1999, for Doodle came up um, with um, an idea and he actually published this in, in Science where he said that maybe phylogenetic trees are not enough because they cannot properly represent all the um, events that are happening in the ancestral uh, history of a set of species. So for example, what a tree cannot represent is um, hybridization or lateral gene transfer where you have like several species that come together, they reshuffle their genome and create a new species. And James Mallet, um, he investigated how frequent, for example, hybridization is. And he found that 25% of all plant species and 10% of animal species, and those are actually mostly the youngest species that they um, have been involved in natural hybridization. So if we wanna represent the evolutionary history and all its complexity, then trees, are really not quite enough because we can, for example, not represent um, hybridization. So here I have just a bunch of examples of um, hybrid species. Here we have a hybrid species between a zebra and a horse. And here we have a hybrid butterfly. 
And the question really is how can we represent this now because we can't really represent it in a tree because in a tree, all these internal vertices uh, correspond to speciation. So if we want to represent hybridization, maybe what we need is actually a network where we have these two um, vertices here. And if we think of them as two species, then at some point in the history, these have come together. Um, they have recombined their genome and created this new hybrid species, this butterfly whose wings are like yellow and red. So again, in terms of graph theory, what is a phylogenetic network? So it's a rooted acyclic diagraph. So we have these underlying cycles, but we do not have any um, directed cycles because there should be no, um, there shouldn't be any cycles um, in which uh, the genetic material gets inherited. So the graph is acyclic. And the root is at the top of the page. Again, the leaves are at the bottom. And now we have actually these two types of vertices. So the first type is S in a tree where we have like in degree one and out degree two. So these do correspond to speciation events. But then additionally, we have these, uh, what we call reticulation vertices. And those are the vertices that have in degree at least two and out degree one. So the reticulation vertices are the ones we do not have in a tree and we use reticulation basically as an umbrella term to describe all the processes that cannot be represented by a tree. Um, in this case here, we have two reticulation vertices indicated in red and we have a total of three reticulation events. And if you want to come up or calculate the number of reticulation events, you basically sum up the in degrees, but for each vertex, you uh, subtract one. So this uh, reticulation vertex, um, it contributes one reticulation event, and this reticulation vertex contributes two reticulation events. So as the take home message for the first five minutes, as well as a phylogenetic network, it's a tree with a cycle. And now let me um, start to talk about a problem that we have in uh, phylogenetics, which is basically that we want to have good ways to reconstruct these networks, these phylogenetic networks. And one idea that is around for about 15 years now is the idea of reconstructing networks from trees. So when you reconstruct trees, the first step is that you come up with what we call a sequence alignment. And you're given all these DNA sequences for all your species that you might be interested in. And you want to rearrange these sequences such that you identify regions of similarity by introducing these gaps, um, which are indicated here by hyphens. So basically what you like to see are these columns that have all the same nucleotides. So for example, this column here, it has only T's, which indicates some um, level of similarity. And now let's say you have like the sequence alignment and it's a sequence alignment for like two genes. And then maybe you want to reconstruct just a gene tree for the first gene, which I've indicated here in red. And obviously these sequences would be much longer, but just for the slide, for the purpose of the slide, the gene is quite short. So let's say you um, reconstruct the gene tree for the red gene and what you come up with is actually the red tree. And then you can do the same for a second gene, the blue gene, and you come up with another tree. So you do have these two trees, they're not the same. So what do you do now? Maybe um, the reason why these tree differs is because of hybridization. For example, if you have um, considered like a bunch of plant species, it's likely that some hybridization have occurred in the um, history of these species. And now one idea would be to embed these two trees into a phylogenetic network. So this is a network on the same set of species from, from A to E. And you can see that the red tree is embedded in the network by just looking at the red edges. And similarly, the blue tree is also embedded in the network. And this network has one reticulation vertex and also one reticulation event. So before I give you like um, a problem statement, 
let me just say that this idea of a tree is embedded in a network is something I will call, um, or I will say that a network displays a tree in the rest of the talk. So if a network displays a tree T, then the tree is in fact embedded in the network. So this tree on the right hand side of the slide is embedded in the network if you just look at the radiators. So this is what I mean by displaying. A network displays a tree or a tree is displayed by a network. And with this, I can give you like a problem definition, uh, which uh, is the problem I wanna focus on for the rest of the talk. So we're given like a bunch of phylogenetic trees as our input. They are all on the same set of leaves. And what we wanna do is we want to reconstruct or find a phylogenetic network that displays all the trees. So each tree in the, in the input set and additionally, we want to find a network that does not only display the trees, but that also has the number of reticulation events minimized. So in this case here, again, this network is minimum because you, the trees are different. So you can't do any better than just one reticulation event. So what do we know about this problem? So as I have said, um, it was first stated, I think, in 2005. And um, it was shown that the problem is um, MP heart. And that's why people started looking at the problem for just two trees. Biologically speaking, that may not be really relevant because most of the times you want to consider more than just two trees. But because it's hard, uh, we needed to start somewhere. So the problem is hard. There do exist. Um, couple of um, characterizations. And the first one is in terms of agreement forest. So I'm not gonna go into detail because agreement forests do not play any role in the rest of the talk, but just to give you an idea, what is an agreement forest for two trees? So you take your two trees and you delete a bunch of edges in both trees. So the trees disconnect and each tree disconnects basically into a forest. And if the two forests that you obtain, one for each input tree, if these two forests are the same, then you would have an agreement forest for the two trees. And here, what you want to optimize or minimize actually is the number of trees in the agreement forest. And then the number of trees in the agreement forest minus one equates to the minimum hybridization number, which is the number of interests. So this is one characterization. And then based on this characterization, um, it was shown that the problem is um, hard. On the positive side, it was also shown that the problem is fixed parameter tractable. So in terms of running time, if we're just focusing on the exponential part of the running time, um, based on the fixed parameter tractability result, um, Magnus, Bolovic and Schad sample obtained an algorithm uh, whose running time is 28K to the K, where K is the number of reticulation events. So the fixed parameter tractable result um, is with the parameter where the parameter is uh, the size of the solution, namely the number of reticulation events. And then later we could show that the um, problem is also fixed parameter tractable if the two input trees are not necessarily binary. So binary means like uh, every tree vertex has in degree one and out degree two. And by non-binary, we, we allow like um, larger out degrees. And there are a bunch of like practical algorithms. In fact, there are like several groups that until today, they try to come up with um, faster and faster algorithms for this problem. There's only one or two implementations um, in Dendroscope, which is a program package to analyze and reconstruct phylogenetic networks. Um, all these results are basically based on the characterization in terms of agreement forests. And for several years, we tried to generalize this characterization to more than two trees. Uh, without much success. So what we then started to think about at some point as well, what happens if instead of um, solving this um, problem of uh, minimizing the number of articulation events, instead of solving this over the space of all phylogenetic networks, can we do something 
if we look at a smaller spice in which we, for example, we put some structural constraints on the networks. And um, the good news is, yes, we can do something. And we started by looking at a very small class of networks, which are temporal tree chart networks. So let me explain to you what these networks are. So uh, first of all, what is a tree chart network? And a tree chart network is a phylogenetic network in which every non-leaf vertex has a child that is either a tree vertex or um, a leaf. So in other words, what we can't have in a tree chart network are these two configurations. One I call a stack in which we have an edge that is incident with two reticulations. And we cannot have a so-called W either, where we have a tree vertex and both of the children of that tree vertex are reticulations. So if we do not have a stack in the network and we do not have a W, then the network is called tree child. So here we have an example of a non-tree child network because uh, we have this W configuration here, whereas this network is tree child. Another constraint that we put uh, on the networks is the so-called temporal constraint. So um, to display these hybridization events in a network, what you would think you will need to observe in, in nature is that at some point, these two ancestral parents of this hybrid vertex, they must coexist in time because at some point they must meet, they come together and they reshuffle their genome and create this hybrid species. So there must be some time in the past where these three uh, red species have coexisted. And similarly for the second reticulation event here, these three green species, they also must coexisted at some point in the history. And when I talk to biologists, some will actually say, uh, we do not really care about this at all. So we do not care if these species have coexisted in time or not. Whereas other biologists think that this is a very good um, constraint to have. So I leave it up to you to judge. But um, in terms of a definition, so a temporal network is a network in which we can um, assign a timestamp to each vertex uh, of the network and we want to do it in a certain way. So we do assign these timestamps to all the vertices such that for every edge from U to V, we have that the timestamp of U is smaller than the timestamp of the child V if the edge is a tree edge. That means the edge is not directed into a reticulation vertex. On the other hand, if the edge from U to V is a reticulation edge, in which case it is directed into a reticulation vertex, we want the two timestamps of U and V to be the same. And if there exists such an assignment of timestamps to the vertices in the network, then we say that the network is temporal. So this one here is temporal. If you look at on the left and the right hand side below the root, you see that the timestamps are strictly increasing. So these are all tree edges. And then for this reticulation event, for example, you have the three timestamps for the hybrid species itself. And for its two parents, they are the same. There are two. And similarly for the other reticulation event. And this network here, it looks pretty similar. So again, two reticulations, but this is non-temporal. Because on this side of the route, you see that the timestamps are strictly increasing, but here you get a conflict. So you go from zero to two, but then down to one. So this is not allowed. And you can try to assign the timestamps in a slightly different way if you like. What you'll see is that you cannot assign timestamps to this network such that the temporal constraint is satisfied. And what we did back in 2013 was asking, well, can we solve this problem in network in the space of all temporal tree chart networks? So we put all these um, constraints on the network and now we're asking, can we um, find an answer to this problem in this reduced space? And this is just like 
some picture about the space. So we have this general space of all phylogenetic networks and then the temporal tree chart network, they form like a, a smaller group of this um, huge network space. So let me remind you on what the problem now is. So we're given still a set of rooted phylogenetic trees on the same leaf set. And now what we want to do is we want to reconstruct a temporal tree chart network that displays every tree in the network and whose number of reticulation events is minimized. So the first thing you may wonder about is, is the problem still hard? Because now we're looking at the smaller subspace or maybe we got lucky and we can actually solve it in polynomial time. But unfortunately, it's so hard. So even for the smaller space, the problem is hard. And also because the, the space is really restricted, um, what you can show is that not every input set of trees admits actually a temporal tree chart network. So maybe your favorite set of trees for which you wanna solve this problem, uh, it can happen that for this set of trees there exists no temporal tree chart network that displays all the trees in your input. Okay, so let me start by explaining uh, our approach for two trees first. And then once we see how it works for two trees, we generalize to an arbitrary set of input trees. So the idea is based on cherries and a cherry in a tree is just um, basically two leaves that have a common parent. So if you look at this tree here, you have two cherries. One is one, two, and the other cherry is six and seven. And what we're going to do is we're picking cherries in our two input trees. So I'll start with an example. So we start with these two trees and we look at the cherries. So the first tree has cherry one, two, and also six and seven. And the second tree has three cherries. And we wanna find an element that is involved in a cherry in both trees. So we could pick one of the four red elements, either one or two or six or seven because they are part of a cherry in both trees. And in this example, I started by picking six. So I'll pick six in the cherry six, seven in this tree, and I'll pick six in the cherry six, one in the second tree, which means I delete six in the two trees. And I'm left with these two trees now. And now I look at these two trees, I look at my cherries. So the first tree now has cherries one and two, and five and seven and the second tree has cherries seven and two and four and five and again i'm asking what is an element that is involved in a cherry in both trees and i can either choose two or five or seven and i have chosen seven so that means i pick seven in both trees and i delete it from my two trees and now we continue doing this so we're left with these two trees and now i can only pick four and five because I actually have a cherry four, five in both trees. And I can't pick any of one and two because neither one nor two is part of a cherry in the second tree. So in the third iteration, I pick four, I delete four. And now I have to pick two because two is the only element involved in a cherry in both trees. After we've picked two, we pick one. And then we're basically left with two trees that have been reduced to a single cherry. So then in the end, I pick three. And in the last step, I pick five. So we have picked the leaves in order six, seven, four, two, one, three, five. And this is what I call a cherry picking sequence for the two trees. So here's the formal definition. It is really an ordering on the elements um, on X where X is the leaf set of the two trees. And at each step, I want to pick a label LI such that LI is in a cherry in both trees. So if this um, condition is satisfied, then the ordering is called a cherry picking sequence for the two input trees. Now, important here to note is that order does matter. So uh, when I talked you through the previous example, we had like a couple of iterations where we could choose like various elements. So I think in the previous example, I started by picking six or seven. What happens if we pick one, for example, as our first element, because one is involved in a cherry in both trees as well, right? So we could pick one. 
we delete one and then we could pick two. Two is involved in a cherry in this tree, two, three, and two is also involved in a cherry in that one. But once I've picked two, I'm left with these two trees and I can't pick anything now because this tree only has cherry six and seven and this tree only has cherry four and five. So there is no element that is involved in a cherry in both trees. So this means that no cherry picking sequence for the two trees starts with one and two. So order matters, we cannot start uh, with um, an arbitrary element that is involved in a cherry. That does not necessarily mean that uh, this will give us a cherry picking sequence for the two trees. So why do I actually talk about cherry picking sequences? So the first thing we could show that um, if we're given two trees and these two trees, they do have a cherry picking sequence, then this is basically equivalent to saying that there exists a temporary tree chart network that displays TNT prime. So this is just the existence question. We're not trying to optimize anything. We're just trying to figure out, does there exist a temporary tree chart network that displays the two trees? Because as you may recall, I mentioned that not every input admits a temporary tree chart network. But the good news here is that if the two trees do have a cherry picking sequence, then such a network exists. And um, only quite recently, we showed that just deciding whether or not such a cherry picking sequence exists is also a hard problem. Okay, so now we have a tool to decide if such a network exists. And now how can we actually not just come up with a temporary tree chart network that displays TNT prime, but in fact, with a temporary tree chart network that displays the two trees and additionally minimizes the number of reticulation events. And for this, um, I want to classify the leaves of a tree that are also part of the cherry picking sequence into special and non-special. So I say that an element of the cherry picking sequence is special if this element Li does not label a leaf of a cherry that is common to, to the two trees. So let's look at the same example again, the example that we um, started with. So again, our two trees, and this was the cherry picking sequence we came up with earlier. So the first element is six. And six is special because six is involved in cherry six and seven and in cherry six and one. So these two cherries are different. So six is special. In the second iteration, we pick seven. And again, seven is special because seven is involved in the cherry five, seven, and it's not a common cherry of the two trees. So in the second tree, we have seven involved in cherry seven, two. Then four is the next element and four is not special because there is a common cherry for five. Two is again special. And then one is also special because we have two different cherries that involve one. And then the last two elements are never special. So three and five are not special. Now you may wonder, well, why are we doing this whole business about special elements? Well, it turns out that if we um, count the number of special elements and we come up with a cherry picking sequence whose number of special elements is minimized, then this actually equates to the number of reticulation events that we need to display the two trees in a network. So we use S of T and T prime to denote the minimum number of special elements in a cherry picking sequence for T and T prime. Over all cherry picking sequences, we want to find one uh, for which S of T and T prime is minimized. And then S of T prime, T and T prime, uh, this number equates to the minimum number of reticulation events that is needed to display T and T prime, the two input trees in a temporary tree chart network. So that's for two trees. And now we try to explain how we can generalize this to more than two trees. So now we're considering like an input set of trees and it could be like 
um, a very large set of input trees. So we do need something that is in some sense between special and non-special because for example, for three trees, you could have a situation where you have two trees that share a, a cherry. So one and two, for example, but then in the third tree, you do not have cherry one and two, but maybe you have cherry two and three. So now the question is, is that special or is it not special, right? So uh, the first result again is we need to decide whether or not an arbitrary large set of trees can be displayed by a temporal tree chart network. And there's nothing new here. So again, if there exists a cherry picking sequence for the input, then the input can be displayed by a temporal tree chart network. And the cherry picking sequence for collection of trees as before. So you want to find an ordering on the leaves such that the leaf labeled uh, the, the leaf is a part of a cherry in each tree of the input. So now to find the minimal number of reticulation events over all temporary tree chart networks that display the input set, we um, again look at the cherries, but now instead of just saying it's special or not special, we assign a count to every um, leaf or to every element of the cherry picking sequence. So we have a cherry picking sequence sigma and we look at each element in the um, sequence and we assign to that element a so-called cherry count um, C of i. And C of i is the number of distinct cherries that contain this um, leaf Li minus one. So let's have a look at this example here. So three trees now, and we start by picking six. So six is involved in cherry six, seven in the first tree, in cherry six, one in the second tree, and in cherry six, three in the third tree. So we have three distinct cherries that involve six. That means the cherry count is three minus one equals two. In the second iteration, we pick seven and seven is together with five in the first tree, seven is together with two in the second tree, and again with two in the third tree. So the cherry count for the second element is just two minus one equals one. And this is what we keep doing. So we pick four then, and four is actually in a common cherry of all three trees. So the cherry count is zero. Then we pick two, and we have two different cherries, two and five in two trees and two and one in one tree. So the cherry count again is one. Then we pick one and its cherry count is one. And finally, for the last two elements, the cherry count is always zero. So that's the cherry count for every element in the cherry picking sequence. And then we compute the weight of the cherry picking sequence. And this is just the sum over all the um, cherry counts. So for this example here, the weight of the cherry picking sequence is five, just like two plus one plus one plus one. And now maybe you can already guess what we're trying to do here, what we're trying to minimize. We want to find a cherry picking sequence for the input set with a minimum weight. And then this minimum weight equates to the minimum number of reticulation events that we need to display uh, the set of trees in a temporary tree chart network. So the theorem is the following. So we're given a set of input trees and suppose that there exists a temporary tree chart network that displays every tree in the input, then the minimum number of reticulation events um, that we need to display the, two, the, the trees in P is the smallest weight of a cherry picking sequence for P over all such sequences. So we want to find a cherry picking sequence of minimum weight. So this solves the problem pretty much for this uh, really small space of temporary chart network. And then more recently, we started to think about, well, what happens if we drop the temporal constraint? 
So now we're basically operating in the space of all tree tight networks, which are the networks that do not have a stack and that do not have a W. And the good news is we can actually do something for tree chart networks as well. So again, just a quick reminder, what's the problem now? If we look at tree chart networks, so we're given a set of trees and now we want to reconstruct a tree chart network, maybe temporal, maybe not temporal. We do not care anymore, but we do want it to be tree chart that displays the input. And again, we want to minimize the number of reticulation events. Um, of course, the problem remains MP hard. Uh, the good news here is that now, no matter what input you're interested in, you can give me any input you like, I can always find a tree chart network for you. So this is quite good in comparison to the temporal tree chart case, because we could not always guarantee that such a network exists at all. Whereas for tree chart networks, such a network exists. And again, yes, Mona, um, sorry, quick question. Sure. Um, I'll, I, by the way, I turned my video off for bandwidth reasons. Anyway, um, about these three child networks, is it um, obvious that you can somehow turn um, a regular, like any network into a three child network uh, easily by just adding some vertices to avoid these constraints or similar moves? So it's true, you can always um, add more leaves to the network and make a tree chart. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. So one, one way to see existence is you just build any network and then you make it tree chart. Um, but you need to be careful about your leaves, right? Because the trees all have the same leaf set. So what do you do? Like you start with a with a network and then you, you want to throw out leaves, I guess. Right? Or okay, so it's yeah, so so it's not that simple. Um you, you want to preserve the same set of leaves. That's right. So you need to be a little bit more careful about the leaves because the trees always have the same leaf set and you want to have a network that has also the same leaves. Okay, thanks. Okay. So um, let me explain um, how we can solve this problem in tree child space by also using cherry picking sequences. But now we slightly change the definition again of what we mean by cherry picking sequence. And all we require now is whenever we pick something is that we want the taxon or the leaf to be part of a cherry in at least one tree. So here I start by picking four in the first tree. And I say I pick the cherry four, five, but four really is only um, together with five in a cherry in the first tree. So four is together with one in the second tree and over here four is together with three. So I pick cherry four, five, and because only the first tree has this cherry, I only delete four in the first tree. Okay, so this is different to what we've seen before where we always picked a leaf in all the trees. So now we're only picking leaves in some of the trees or maybe in all trees, but not necessarily at each step. So then after picking um, four in the first tree, we focus on cherry four one. And this is again only a cherry in one tree, the second tree. So I pick four in the second tree. So I always pick the first element in that um, tuple. So we have picked four from these two trees and now we pick another cherry and maybe we pick four three, which is a cherry in the third tree. That means we delete four in the third tree. And now let's say maybe we pick cherry five, six. Five, six is again only a cherry in one of the three trees. So we pick five from the first tree. Then we pick cherry five, three. That means we delete five in the second tree. And then we delete five in the last tree in the third tree by picking cherry five, eight. Now, what do we do now? So we pick cherry two, three and two, three actually is a cherry 
in each input tree. So this means we delete two in each of the three trees. And then we pick cherry three one. And again, this is a cherry in all three trees. So we delete three in all three. And then we look at cherry six, seven. Again, it's a cherry in all three. So we delete six. Then seven, eight, we delete seven in all three trees. And then we're left with one and eight. And we first pick one and then we pick eight. So what is the weight now? So before the weight was uh, related to the cherry count. And now we look at the length of the sequence that we get. And we subtract the original number of leaves, which is the, uh, just the cardinality of X. X is the leaf set of the um, input trees. And this gives us the weight. So the weight of this cherry picking sequence is 12 minus eight equals four. So this was basically what I mean by tree child sequence. Um, by uh, using this example. And here is the former definition of, of a cherry picking sequence in tree child space. So basically we have um, a sequence of tuples and every tuple except for the last one, it contains two elements of the leaf set. And we have one additional property. So the property is whenever we pick an element, which means that uh, it is an X coordinate, so it's the first coordinate, then we cannot see the same element later on as a Y coordinate. So if we look at this sequence here, this is not a tree child sequence because the first tuple here we pick four and then later on we see four as the second coordinate and this is not allowed under this definition. Okay, so this is the only um, slight technicality here. But if we do pick uh, the leaves according to the definition of a tree child sequence and we um, define the y to be the length of the sequence minus x, then we actually do get the following theorem, namely for a set of rooted phylogenetic trees, the minimum um, weight of a cherry picking sequence equates to the minimum number of reticulation events that we need to display our input trees in a tree chart network. So we can solve the problem for tree chart networks as well using a cherry picking sequence approach. And uh, let me finish by just um, talking about a couple more good news. So we can extend this approach further and we can extend it so that it works um, in the most general setting where we consider all phylogenetic networks, it's more involved. And um, it's actually interesting, Nina, that you mentioned this already, that you can um, transform basically every phylogenetic network into a tree chart network by adding um, leaves. And this idea is in fact also what we use to show how this approach extends to all phylogenetic networks by throwing in additional taxa or leaves. And we can also show that this approach works for binary and non-binary trees. So with the agreement forest approach, the agreement forest characterization that I mentioned before, it's really difficult to upgrade from binary to non-binary trees. Whereas if you use cherry picking sequences, you almost get the non-binary uh, results for free. So this is quite easy. Um, it has all been published like last year. And there's also like a practical implementation of uh, the algorithm for tree chart networks. And this is by, um, a paper by Leo van Eersel and his group in the Netherlands. And they basically took our approach and they showed that for binary trees, there exists again, a fixed parameter tractable algorithm. And it works quite quickly as long as the number of reticulation events is small, that means roughly between seven and 12. And they can show that their algorithm works for up to 100 input trees and each input tree with about 200 taxa. So I'll finish here and um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Simona. Let's all unmute ourselves and give her a clap. 
Um, are there any questions for Simona? I have to admit I had two questions and you answered them in, in your last two slides. <laughs> so whether you can generalize to networks and whether you have a fixed parameter track to go after. Yeah, so there is a result and it's something like 8k to the k, where k is again the number of articulation events. And they use like a branch and bound type, like a mm -hmm. branch and bound technique. Okay, are there other questions? I might have one small for you. I might have missed something, but so you you did define like kind of two different like uh, weight or to repeat weight in the case where it's temporal and like general case. And do they relate to each other? Or is that like, what, what happens if you apply the second definition to the temporal case? You can, yeah, you can, you can modify it slightly. Okay. But because we, we did it first for the smaller space, so um, this is, I guess, why I, give you, I gave you the definition that, that we first came up with for, for the weight of the cherry picking sequence. Yeah, and I have, a, I have another one. And you, so even for the first case, you show that even for two trees, like the existence of cherry picking sequences NPR, NPR, and is there any way to like add some constraint to the tree in order to make that rem not NPR? Like a concern that will make sense in terms of biology or something. Sorry, I, I, I didn't hear what you what what do you want to add? <laughs> some constraint into the, the tree. So the same way you add at one point a constraint to every temporal. Oh, I see. So that the problem is easier then. Yeah. I don't know if it's constraint. Yeah. Okay. I, don't, I don't know of any constraint. Um, to solve this min network problem, um, yeah, so far we do not know if there exists like an even smaller space, something very special for which we can solve the problem in polynomial time. It would be interesting, but uh, we just looked at something like a month ago where we <laughs> were quite hopeful. It was really restricted, but even for that, uh, we think it, it might still be MP hard. <laughs> Thank you. Are there more questions? Um, I have one. So um, you defined the two um, restrictions for the tree child networks. Is there any biological intuition to, to them what they correspond to in evolution? Tree chart network. So um, I guess the honest answer is no. So we do like tree chart network from a medical perspective because there are some problems which are hard in general, but that you can solve in polynomial time for tree chart networks. But yeah, like for temporal networks, I think this might be biologically relevant. But for tree chart networks, I'm I'm less sure. So for me, it's really like from more like from mathematical perspective that we say this is a, an interesting constraint to consider because sometimes um, questions that are hard in general become polynomial time solvable for tree chart networks. Thanks. Okay. Um. Let me stop the video here. But before I do, let's all give uh, Simona another clap of applause for a very nice talk. Thank you. Thank you.